Hello and welcome to the Agile Innovation Leaders Podcast. I'm Ola Ojako. On this podcast, I speak with world-class leaders and doers about themselves and a variety of topics spanning agile, lean innovation, business, leadership, and much more with actionable takeaways for you, the listener. So Richard, thank you so much for joining us on the Agile Innovation Leaders Podcast. No, pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Now, as I start with all my guests, we want to know who Richard Stevens is. So can you tell us about yourself? Uh, well, it depends what you want to know, Ula. Um, I'm a solicitor and it's not, it's not terribly exciting by as, as professions go. Um, so I spend a lot of time um, uh, reading long documents, commenting on them, marking them up, doing contracts. Um, it's probably everyone's worst nightmare when it comes to um, a profession, really, I suppose. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> well, I like the way you've just um, summarized your profession as reading long documents and making comments. I'm wondering if you ever like um, had long debates over phrases and words in a document. Yes, that's what the job consists of. And uh, when you get into negotiating big contracts and uh, it, over my career, I've done huge, been involved in huge global outsourcing, huge cloud contracts, huge development implementation contracts. Uh, the job consists of of arguing about words and, and trying to get it right for your client, to be honest. Um, you don't want to uh, leave any um, slippery bananas in there, uh, which are going to trip them up uh, later on. Mm. So that phrase, slippery bananas, we'll get back to it. But in the meantime, how did you end up, you know, in a career in law because you said the way you've described it you said it's it's not the most exciting thing so there must have been something that still drew you to this quote-unquote non-exciting path well I don't know really you know I mean you just um I don't know why do you do anything when you're young and you decide to become you know typically young little boys will say well I want to be a train driver or you know, whatever and uh, you know you just as you grow up you just become gravitated to do something and there are a lot of us in our school who said they wanted to be lawyers others said they wanted to be consultants others wanted to be accountants and um, uh, but you have to understand that I, I worked in a time when uh, IT didn't really exist so though I don't think there was anybody who uh, wanted to go into technology for example because I was you know at school in the in the 70s so mm. Um, that was very much uh, an arcane, shut-away uh, job where people would wear white coats and go into air-conditioned, filtered air rooms to feed mainframe monsters. But, uh, of course, that sort of thing uh, we knew nothing about. I don't know. So I don't know why I went into being a lawyer. I mean, I could have run away to the circus, I suppose, but <laughs> I lacked the courage to do it, I suppose. But too boring and unadventurous. It's a typical lawyer, you see. Okay. Okay. Well, um that's uh, an interesting, um, well, I say, narrative of, of your career to date. So do you have any thing you would have done differently, knowing what you now know? I think I would have run away to the circus. We love education. Okay, well, um, that's an interesting uh, response, Richard. Well, thanks for sharing your, your career story to date. And um, so for someone who is, for example, listening and that's considering a career in law, that you know, no matter what stage in life they're at, what would be your, your advice? Oh, don't put your daughter on the stage, Mrs. Robinson, I think it's, it's probably what I would say. Um, <laughs> You know, there are all the different types of lawyers and uh, you can go through uh, lawyers who do criminal work, for example. And that, and I think some lawyers get a, a, a good deal of pleasure out of doing that sort of thing. Mm. Um, uh, I don't think it, the criminal lawyers make a huge amount of money out of it. Or a lot of people do very harrowing areas of law, like family, domestic law, and they're dealing with um, battered um, people of... of frankly, these days, both sexes and yeah. uh, horrible um, uh, you know, emotional scars and you know, battles over. But I, you know, I, I went to, did some of my CPD and I went to a talk given by a probate mediator. Now you'd think that probate was a nice um, sedate area of the law, but that's the most, he said, it's the most vicious 
dispute-ridden thing because he said all families will have secrets and they will harbour them. And he said what will happen is that um, you know, Aunt Maud dies and she has some valuable art collection or something like that. And then all these little all these little disputes and resentments that you've had against your elder brother for 30 years suddenly all bubble to the surface. And he said, it all comes out in a horrible, vicious fight. Um, people are going into Aunt Maud's house and stealing her property while she's dead. And they're arguing over who gets the fine china and who gets this and who gets that. And he said, one of the, you know, the horrible things is that, you know, it, it, when he does the settlement between the brothers or whoever it may be, and one of the clauses he's very often asked to put in is that such and such brother should not ever again seek to contact him um, wow. by, you know, you know, by phone, email, writing, or anything. And, and so you, you get that sort of thing as well. So, but you know, why it is I would become um, a commercial lawyer, I say it's it's dull and boring. Actually, when you get in a, a deal, you get the excitement of trying to you know, work the deal together, put it all together, bring it all together for the day of signature, I say there is a pressure, a dynamic, and every team has its own dynamic and you're working towards getting something done. Hmm. A bit like um, looking at your your agile principles as well, I suppose, um, you know, you're, you're trying to get it done. Although it's not done in incremental delivery, it's all done in one big drop at the end on the day of signature, of course. Hmm. No, that's, um, that's an interesting story about, you know, different kinds of law probate and 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 going tying it back to commercial law which you practice if i'm correct in the understanding yeah that, that, that's right i mean i i i've worked for myself and i so i i do the big contracts and i certainly do that i, I work for smes as well but um one of the things i also do is i, I work as a, a mediator and an arbitrator in the it sector so i'm, I'm there either helping people resolve disputes or as an arbitrator i'm actually uh, resolving disputes issuing binding uh, awards uh, I also provide some coaching in, in commercial law subjects as well. So mm. I, I do a, a, a variety of different things and uh, helps keep my sanity. Now, uh, the, the, the phrase slippery bananas, because you said, you know, when you're drafting contracts, you make sure you're avoiding those slippery bananas. So what per, what's the perspective? Could you Could you give us a glimpse into what goes on you know, behind the scenes or in your mind, at the back of your mind, when you're, um, you know, drafting, you're involved in drafting and reviewing contracts on behalf of a client, what's the perspective you're doing this from? The first uh, line is, and the first principle I start from, is that projects, as has been said before, projects don't go wrong for terms and conditions. And I have a friend in the industry uh, who, who says that, and he, like he, me, works for himself, uh, and he says that when he's doing a big contract over a major client, he's up against a really big City of London law firm. He's he's there. Uh, he'll be negotiating the front end, as we call it, the terms, conditions, the legal bit that, that goes at the front, the core of the contract. And he'll spend days talking about liabilities and warranties and indemnities. He says, I'm talking with the partner of the law firm on that. He said, but when it comes to talking about the scope, the SLA, uh, the charging schedule, all these things. He said, he, I end up negotiating with the trainee. He said, well, why does a contract go wrong? It won't be for anything to do with the indemnities or the liabilities or the warranties. They're there for after it has gone wrong. Why does it go wrong? It goes wrong for the things that are in the schedules, the operational things. Hmm. That's the thing that you get wrong. Uh, and the second principle I move on to is, is this, that in my lifetime, I think drafting has simply got worse and worse and worse, and uh, contracts have got longer and longer and longer. Uh, and so having talked about slippery banana skins, then we now get on to another metaphor. We talk about kicking the can down the street uh, as lawyers uh, find it harder and harder to come to agreement on important issues. You know, when will such and such, such and such a sum be paid? Um, you know, what do you have to do to get acceptance of milestone three such that payment can be released? And so they then insert um, modern drafting, like um, the parties will reasonably agree um, the amount to be 
uh, released. And it's called Kicking the Can Down the Street. It's not actually legally binding. It's not actually, it's nothing. It's a thing written in wind and water. It gets rid of the immediate problem. Uh, and all you're saying is that, you know, the judge or the arbitrator later on can make the decision for you. Or you hope they can. They may just mm. throw it out and say, well, it's not really an agreement at all. Um, so uh, so that, 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 I think, those are the things, the things that I have um, noticed in, in my career. And, uh, uh, and those, I think, are the, the banana skins, the slippery bananas I try to avoid for my client wherever possible. Well, that's interesting. And how, how successful is it? Would you say that a good contract then, this is me stating my view and as a non-expert in this area, I would stand to be corrected by yourself. So would a good contract be drafted in a way that enforces um, both parties to act in the best interests of the other? Does it always re result in a win-win situation? No, okay. uh, because um, uh, I'm an English lawyer. I deal with the English common law, and the common law has typically and traditionally taken the line and still to a very large extent does that each party looks after its own interests uh, I'm not here uh, when I represent a party I'm not looking after the other party's interests at all uh, and my um, uh, uh, my instructions so to speak or my implicit instructions are to do the best deal for my clients do the worst deal for my opponents now of course that means I, I'm not actually trying to um, hamper them or hinder them or throw banana skins under their feet uh, because of course if I hamper them or hinder them in the contract it could come back on me or come back on my client I should say later on if it's a you know a long project mm. or an outsourcing where the parties have to cooperate so you, you do have to get a, a sort of balance but the common laws approach the English common laws approach is typically that each party is expected to enter into a contract looking after its own interests right. it's actually highly topical uh, yeah. the uh, i don't want to you probably don't want to get into the um riveting and fascinating details of english look contract law and it's and it's sort of moved in practice and theoretically to adopting a what we might call a more uh, continental civil law approach by trying to import concepts of good faith mm. uh, reasonableness uh, which are concepts i have to say which are still by and large alien uh, to to my system of law, to the system of law in the country in which we live. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, so how then, because we, we've, we've, we've kind of dug into, you know, speaking about contracts for the, um, in the interest of the listener who probably is just jumping in and wondering, okay, what are they talking about? What would you define a contract as? It's just a binding agreement for someone to do something for someone else and for the other to do something to the other party, which is normally payment. Um, it, it, that, that's all it is. But contracts are all around us. And so, I mean, obviously, not your, it looks like you're sitting at home at the moment and yes. uh, you're not in an office. Um, but if you, on the days of your, or hopefully the days to come, when you go back into an office or you go to a physical meeting and you might stop in a little shop somewhere and buy yourself a cup of coffee, well, that's a contract. Uh, it's actually quite a complex contract as well because it's a, it's a sale of goods and to some extent services if they are making the coffee for you in front of you. Um, it imports therefore goods, uh, the law to do with the sale of goods and services. It imports a whole lot of law to do with consumer law because you're a consumer buying a coffee. It's got mm. a lot of law in there to do with health and safety because um, you, know, you want your coffee shop to be a safe place from which to buy your beverage. Yeah. Um, so if you look at that and you talk all the law and regulations relating to that very simple, I'll have a, a cappuccino, please. The, the, you could probably fill a shelf with just the law and the cases dealing with sales of goods and services, health and safety, consumer law and all the rest of it. But you don't, you, you don't need to worry about that, Ula, hmm. because you, all you want is your cappuccino at the end of the day. So it, it's, uh, uh, but that is a contract and the contracts are all around us. And the seller, I would, I would dare say, wants to be paid for the cup of cappuccino they I mean, made that, for that's, me. That's the consideration, of course. That's traditionally the consideration, hmm. uh, which has been a, a key feature, of course, of, uh, of, of English contract law, not necessarily other um, uh, systems of contract law. Uh, the Scots, for example, don't require uh, consideration in their system of uh, contract law, so they don't require one party to do something 
for the other in exchange for something else. It can be a, a one-sided thing. Um, but don't ask me how they get by, but they do. But the idea of consideration it grew up um, just to show, just to sort of mark out, as it were, um, a casual deal, which you didn't really think was a contract from a proper contract. But a con a consideration can be anything. It can be a promise to do anything. Um, it can be um, a promise to um, go for a walk around the park afterwards. So, I mean, it could be it could be a thing of commercial, it could be commercially valuous. And, th and that's why we have the concept of the peppercorn rent. Have you heard of a peppercorn rent? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Could you explain, it's, please? It's, it's where you rent a property in exchange for the promise to pay a peppercorn, where well, the peppercorn has no commercial value at all but it's a promise to hand over a peppercorn and the promise and it's that promise that makes the contract a binding thing it's, hmm. you don't even have to hand it over it but if you promise to pay the peppercorn that's the consideration i'd like to see anyone suing someone else for a peppercorn but um maybe the law, law reports have got examples of that but i know not but we're getting wow. into the levels of detail there but um oh well uh, you might find me weird, but I do find the concept of contracts um, interesting. And the fact that someone is promising a peppercorn, is it to show that there has been some sort of fair exchange between the two par it, parties? It simply marks out a, a contract from what would otherwise be a gift. Hmm. Uh, and um, it, it simply marks out what a contract is. So the law simply said, we want these just these early signs. Just they have to be a basic that the parties were actually serious about entering into a contract. And so they required consideration. And I say consideration can be commercially valueless, but it's just that the parties have thought to do something for each other. Hmm. Um, we wouldn't even get into an intention to uh, um, create legal relations, which is another requirement. Um, and they, you get, you still get some fantastic cases on that. And uh, the case of Blue and Ashley recently, it, which is where uh, Mr. Blue worked for Mike Ashley as sports direct, and they were all drinking heavily in the pub. And uh, the evidence was at the end of the evening um, uh, that the, they consumed about 14, 15 pints of beer by the end of the evening, although Mr. Blue wasn't present at that stage. But the evidence was that uh, Mike Ashley said that if you can get my share price over eight pounds, um, then I will give you... Uh, uh, you know, a huge bonus of several million pounds. I forget exactly how much it was. Um, well, is that is that a contract? And uh, it went to the High Court, and the High Court had to well, I know. What do you think? If, if, is that a contract or not? Um, it was said um, the share price did go eight, over eight pounds, and Mr. Blue carried on working there, trying to make sure that the share price was maximised. He did actually get an ex-Croatia bonus of one million pounds from Sports Direct. So did that make a contract? That's a question. It's a good <laughs> question. A question. <laughs> yes, because I, I, uh, I, I audited a, a course in contract law um, being taught by a Harvard uh, professor. So of course the focus is on the US laws and all that, so not necessarily here, but there's like, intent of the of the person you know if it's a if it's a phrase that or some a statement that's been made jokingly um you know how outrageous it is or whether the other party is being seen to get something in fair exchange or whether it's a promise for a gift you know for, so in those in those uh, situations the three situations i've mentioned it probably wouldn't hold water in a, in a court of law if someone promised you a gift because it's not contractually binding. But that's it. You're learning legal skills already because you know what you've done, don't you? So, you've actually used the word probably. You haven't committed yourself. No. <laughs> and you, you, you've actually used the word probably because you're, you're not willing to, to bet the farm on one decision or the other, one result or the other. You know the old joke don't you, about um, the client who goes into the solicitor's office and speaks to the receptionist and says, uh, I want a meeting with the, the one-armed lawyer, please. And the receptionist says, we haven't got a one-armed lawyer here. Why, why do you want to meet a one-armed lawyer? And he said, 
but I'm fed up with saying meeting lawyers who say on the one hand this, on the one hand that. <laughs> uh, so, and, but you've done it immediately. You've used that little word probably, and it just came tumbling out in your speech, and you probably didn't even notice it, but I can recognise that you have legal skills already. Uh, very kind of you, Richard. Um, that means a lot coming from you. But I do, I do fancy myself going in, you know, to to go and do some sort of uh, studies in law at some point in time. Um, wish me luck. But this brings us to the concept of agile. Have you, you know, have you had any experience with agile, and what does that mean to you? That term. Uh, agile, I, I first got used to Agile um, when I was doing a lot of big scale um, litigation uh, when I was working in the city as a partner in uh, a law firm there. And I did a lot of very large IT disputes and it, it introduced me to some very uh, odd concepts and we had to get uh, used to reading up about uh, methods and so on some government projects, they mandated in those days, I don't know what they still do, but in those days they were mandating the use of SSADM uh, and prints uh, uh, overlaid on that as a management methodology. And, and we looked at this and it was very odd and I found it very strange because um, what the SSADM and prints would be doing would be mandating behaviours and actions that were flatly contradictory of the contract that had been written for the parties. And so moving on from that, as uh, Agile became the big thing, and we had, first of all, things like extreme programming and that, that, that was getting everything going. And then other more formalized methods of Agile working or Agile development came out. And I got involved with looking through um, DSDM as it, as it then was. Hmm. And thinking, and the, thing, and the the word that struck me was um, that everything will be um, fit for business purpose, and um, and of course, fit for purpose is very much a legal expression that's used in in sales of goods contracts. And I thought, well, what does it mean to have an agile contract where you're promising the client that something is going to be fit for business purpose? What is the business purpose? Did you know what it was before you started? What if it changes? I'm a lawyer, and I ask all of these questions: What if? What if? if. So I got very interested in, in writing DSDM and I, I put together a, an industry committee of in-house lawyers working for tech companies and others and we were just just looking through Agile and we had um, uh, a very senior person from the DSDM consortium come and speak to us and train us on DSDM and mm. give us examples of how DSDM could uh, deliver in a way that was better than uh, you know the old waterfall method mm. of delivery uh, especially when they were allied with um, the cumbersome approach of, of Prince 2. Hmm. And so we got very interested in this and we, we tried thinking, well, what would a, an agile contract, an, a contract for agile development actually look like? And, you know, how would you word it? How would it be different from what lawyers have been drafting up until that point? And we had a, had a go at it and we sort of let it sort of slip and slide and you know, we all moved on to, to different things. And so we, we never got there, but it's it's never gone away as a problem. Um, and I think it is a problem. And um, I've given uh, various talks. And Westlife was a, a, a proponent of contracting for agile development, agile implementation. At the time I was doing this, I find myself now cast in the role of villain. And, uh, and Stuart, a chap called Stuart James, has been taking the role of proponent of agile contracts. And I... Uh, and I sort of, uh, I'm the devil's advocate and I, uh, and I propose different, uh, a different way of working and I just try and, and rubbish the view. And so uh, we had a go at each other that uh, there, we've had a go at each other um, at Tech UK, if you know Tech UK, which is the um, uh, industry body representing IT suppliers okay. in uh, the UK. Um, uh, and we recently had another little go at each other in the BCS as a follow-up to that talk we both attended over Zoom. Yes. Um, but interestingly, um, they, they had a poll at the end and, um, uh, and it, it, got a, it garnered a huge amount of attention. We had a poll at the end and said, having heard the speakers, do you have any confidence in the ability to contract for Agile? And um, uh, over 70% um, uh, said they either had little confidence or no confidence in being able to contract for Agile. Hmm. So, 
and and why would you why do you think there is that low confidence what could be some of the root causes for this oh because i i took them through um the uh the points I, i've made before and i, I just pointed out that it, the agile working uh, doesn't fit in with English law. And we've already covered that off in a sense, because, yeah. uh, and, I, and I said to you that each party expects, uh, the, the English law, sorry, I should say, English law expects each party to look after its own interests. And this idea of collaborative working, where you're working together to do the best you can with the resources available, um, and, and trying to come up with incremental deliveries, lots of short, sharp, uh, deliveries that are, are give meaningful functionality to uh, the customer uh, and agreeing things on the fly. Th these things just don't sit very happily with a legal system that expects each party to look after its own interests. Um, mm -hmm. A legal system which requires a solid agreement and which doesn't really regard reasonable endeavors, all these things and good faith, doesn't regard these things as binding principles in law. Right. Okay. Now, but in a case where on one hand, you know, the two, you know, the two parties are more involved in the contract setting, are saying, all right, we'll act in good faith. But at the same time, we would have our lawyers, our legal people, you know, put together an ironclad contract. Do you think that situation that hypothetical situation is possible in your experience um uh, no it's not it's not possible at all and that that's the real problem uh, and i could take you through some of the cases that that, that show this if you like and I, referring to one of them um i just got up the slide deck now uh might might be very interesting to you it, it goes back to your first question of what's the point of a contract why, why have it because uh, as uh, the, the last outing I had, and um, we had Andrew Craddock from the Agile Foundation, uh, and he was uh, proposing, you know, the, the the benefits and the efficacy of uh, Agile, Agile development, Agile implementation. Um, but of course, uh, uh, and he was saying it was just wonderful. It's wonderful. You know, beats waterfall hands down. It sort of delivers these great things. And of course, and I said, the first point I made was, well, if it's that good, you probably don't need a contract anyway, then, do you? Because if it's never going to go into a dispute, um, then you don't need a contract. On the other hand, if you're a responsible business, you'll be having, you'll be asking yourself, you should be asking yourself as the directors of a responsible business, well, what if the project doesn't go yeah. very well? What if it doesn't? What if it fails? What if I don't get uh, what I, I expect at the end of the day? Uh, and in that talk, I propose two reasons, uh, and that uh, two reasons are both two sides of the same coin um, for why an agile contract simply doesn't work. Uh, and the first reason is a legal reason. The other reason is, is a commercial reason. Mm. The second reason is what I call the FD principle or the financial director principle. Right. Uh, and the legal reason, is, is, to put it uh, shortly, is that the law, as I say, doesn't recognise a contract for good faith. And in, in any case, even if it did, um, you'd just be kicking the can down the street because if you had a contract to do what you did in good faith, if it all went horribly wrong, which in, in, it inevitably will, um, how would you know whether someone had performed in good faith anyway? You just end up in another dispute working out what the dispute was all about. Um, so, and the second reason, as I say, is the FD principle, because when I was doing this DSDM thing and I was chatting to um, a financial director of a good size, medium sized company that was moving very much into uh, uh, IT and technology, it was uh, mostly in the manufacturing sector, but very much absorbing IT and what tech could do for it. Uh, and as he said, look, I have the final sign off um, for any major expenditure. So he said, if I get a contract for five million pounds, he said, I want to know that at the end of the day, I've got something when it's over that I, that I can touch, that I can feel with my fingers, hold with my hands. And I want to know that that's worth five million pounds, at least five million pounds to my business. Hmm. Uh, and he said, if I just get a contract that's agile, which but people are simply saying, well, we'll work in good faith with each other and we don't know what we'll deliver, but there'll be small little bits incrementally and uh, you'll you may or may not, to use the language of um, DSDM in the old days, you know, they have this concept of the minimum usable subset. Exactly. Um, and he said, well, it, I, I, is that worth five million pounds? Because if that's only 60, 70 percent of the full five million pounds, then I've been robbed, haven't I? I've lost hmm. I've lost 30 percent of what I contracted for. 
Uh, and that's what I call, therefore, the, the FD principle. And, and I remember when we were trying to draw, draw up uh, an agile contract, we, we were pulling teeth, trying to satisfy that FD or his ilk that the contract would have some sort of effect, something that could be used to beat the supplier over the head. Hmm. But um, uh, I, I don't think we succeeded. And, and the problem is that every agile contract since um, just um, drifts into this language, as you've said already, of good faith and reasonable endeavors and reasonable agreements on this. And these are all things that English law simply doesn't recognize. Now that's an interesting story, and you've you've just brought to um, to light another perspective that's not usually explicitly considered in drafting contracts, which is that of the finances, the people who hold the purse strings, the people who sign off, you know, the projects or the programs of work. Sometimes, um, you know, people have the notion that you know agile is a you know, the be all and end all, it's not. There is still a place for waterfall, but waterfall is good for where you have straightforward issues. You, you have a problem, you know the solution, and there's a straight line from A to B. There's no need to go agile. But if it's a complex adaptive system, you know, problem where it's complex and as things change, you know, the environmental change, the, the nature of the problem, you know, keeps changing. You have to and um, will I say adopt an agile approach to that now that's why the concept of a minimum viable product comes into play and part of it is that you know you 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 identify the minimum viable product you state your assumptions and then you you know create those you know ba experiments based on the hypothesis of the assumptions you've made and if you're validating if your assumptions are validated, then you can go forward with, you know, the initiative. But if at the very, you know, early instance, you, you, you're having negative um, results, you know, that negate your, your assumptions, then there's no need to go forward. Although from the financial director's perspective, you know, you say, OK, I've wasted it. I didn't get a million's worth of money. But the learning has shown that it's a dead end we're moving towards. And it's better that we stop at a million than spending 10 million or even some other humongous amount on something that's probably not going to give any more learn. return. I think it's time to test your legal skills again then, isn't it? Because... <laughs> Because I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a legal profession, no, but, uh, but you, professional. I think you are a very modest lady indeed. I think if you've <laughs> studied, probably not going to go and say you studied at the New York bar as well. But let me let me test your legal skills again. Okay. Uh, and De Beers is the big diamond sorting diamond uh, company in the world, as you may have heard of them. And Atos Origin is another company uh, you will doubtless have heard of. Uh, and they came to blows uh, back in 2010 because they put out an ITT for their diamond sorting and aggregating process, which of course is dealing with very high value things, namely diamonds. Uh, and so it's all gotta be, it's, it's a very difficult system to replicate and very, it had all sorts of security and things built into it. So at first they, they started doing the um, requirements analysis uh, and they did a, a mini survey and they got their own view of, of what it was and what was involved in doing this complex system. Uh, they started the work and found out it was a hell of a lot more complex than they thought. And because De Beers and their operatives started asking for more and more and more, uh, and it, it got much more expensive. So the original price was 2.9 million. And Atos said, well, actually, it's going to cost nearly 5 million more than that to deliver everything you actually want. Um, but it's interesting looking at um, what they, they, they said, because their Atos internal report said, uh, this project was originally intended to be developed agile style. The team was organized into BAs who would define the requirement and a pool of devs would be organized into teams to build elements of the solution incrementally with a project beyond the requirements definition set up scrum style. This must be music to your ears, I would have thought, Ula. Um, all supported by an architect and a few key designer devs, all very DSDM and can work fine in the right context and, of course, with the right customer. But what happened was Atos said, we need this extra five million odd um, to complete the project. Uh, De Beers said, uh, I would have thought if anyone had to five million pounds sitting around, it was like De Beers with all their diamonds, just said a couple of those, I would have thought it was fine, but they said, get off site. Uh, and it all uh, fell apart and they ended up in court. But which way did it go? 
Um, so you've got Atos, who's done the requirements analysis. They've done their best. They've tried to work out what was involved. Um, they underbid. Um, you've got De Beers that's asked for more and more and more during the requirements analysis. Who wins at the end of the day? This is the time to put that Harvard training to use. <laughs> and no use of the word probably. Who won? Someone won and someone lost. Before I answer your question, I'll just say that I, I, I'm, I'm taking it in good faith. You're not being sarcastic about my auditing the Harvard course online. But in, in, so my, my answer to your question is going to be, it depends. Because all I know right now are the details you've given me. And I know that there's usually more than, than, you know, that, than to, to a situation that meets the eye. So it, it depends again. I can see Atos's point of view in the sense that if they did some sort of initial discovery work and had given a quote based on the bear's requirements now and over time you know the bears is asking for more definitely that's called you know scoped creep and there might be some things it's it, it, it inevitably would result in in more costs now on the bear's hand if they had been promised a pipe dream that agile is equal to cheaper or fixed costs so they had also been working on a misinformed basis in the fact that they thought, okay, yeah, Agile solves everything and it's going to be cheaper and faster. That's yeah. not true. So we've got so far on the one hand of this and on the other hand there. So yes. I'm looking for the one-armed lawyer now. <laughs> I can see both your hands now. Ula. Well, I, I think I wouldn't qualify Ooh, for a one-armed <laughs> lawyer. And, and the key thing is to know that I, I, I think it's, it's the, the beginning of wisdom is to know that there is a limit to what I know. And in this case, it is definitely um, a good example. I don't know all the details behind it to make a firm judgment you, in you, favor you, or against one or the other. I, I, think you, I think you know enough actually come to, to, to have a go. Can I tell you what the judge said? I'd like to know what the judge said, please. In my judgment, he said, Atos went into this contract with his eyes at least half open in the sense that it knew or should have known that it had not acquired a good grasp of the detail of De Beers' diamond sorting and aggregating process. So Atos lost is the hmm. important thing on that one. Uh, and uh, because the general, well, well let, me, uh, let me try you, let me test your legal skills again in case of Boyguard <laughs> against EON. <laughs> okay, this is all about to do with constructing offshore wind turbines, okay? Mm -hmm. see a lot of those around we don't see them because they're offshore but uh, you've seen wind turbines on on land yeah and um the employer so the customer um in construction contracts are known as the employer uh, mandated the use of an international standard called j101 for the construction of these wind turbines okay so um Hoygaard had to use j101 or the methodologies for constructing wind turbines as set out in that contract in, in that international standard, I should say. Okay, so it started using J101, and what nobody knew was that J101 was fundamentally flawed. It had a design defect in it, and it underestimated the strength of the foundations needed to be built. So as soon as they built these um, uh, wind turbines, they started collapsing, and it cost 26 million pounds to put them right. 26 million euros, I think, in those days. Okay. So the question was, who was responsible? Well, Hoygaard said, well, you told me to use J101, so we only did what you said. Um, and EON said, well, it doesn't matter. You're the provider, you're supplier. You, you should jolly well know, and you take the responsibility. It's a straightforward legal question. Mm -hmm. uh, so no one no hand, one hand on the other. Hand. other. <laughs> who wins so straight and who is... <laughs> Again, based on the details you've said, I would say that EON is liable. Eon is the employer, so they've mandated yeah. the use of this standard. Yeah, so my, my, my view is that Eon is liable because they mandated the use of the standard. Now, that would be my view. Be, yeah, if that's the contract and you, you, know, you told someone, build this for me and use this standard because that's what we want. Now, as a responsible supplier, though, I would want to go, you know, to offer advice on 
what I think are the, you know, the pros and cons of, of their decision, but finally the client's decision is theirs. So the, Eon. So Eon as the employer takes the rap, they have to cough up 26 million euros, went all the way to the Supreme Court and they said it was the builder's responsibility. So even where the user has mandated hmm. a particular method, then it's the developer. The courts, they said, are generally inclined to give full effect to the requirement that the item as produced complies with the prescribed criteria. Even if, even if the customer or employer has specified or approved the design, it's the contractor who can be expected to take the risk. If he agreed to work to a design which would render the item incapable of meeting the criteria to which he has agreed. And it's not an inflexible rule of law, it's an approach of the courts. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this is one of the things that's highly relevant to Agile because the parties are working cooperatively and it may well be the customer that's mandating the use of to, to get this result or to use this method to get it and both parties are working in good faith. But when it all goes horribly wrong, yeah. which inevitably will, the court's approach is generally, it's not mandated, you can put something different in your contract. The approach of the court is going to be, well, it's the developer, it's the provider, it's the supplier who's going to take the rap at the end of the day. And this is when you come back to the FD problem, because as soon as you then put something in your contract saying, uh, nothing to do with us, Gov, it's all your responsibility, uh, and we're not, you know, we'll just, we're just, you know, humble operatives doing as we're told, the FD is not going to sign it off. Mm. He's going to say, well, I'm paying my £5 million. I want you to take some responsibility. I want you to take the responsibility at the end of the day. Uh, and as I say, the, these are the... Uh, these are the interesting reasons why, in fact, trying to contract for Agile is not so easy as you might think. Hmm. So what would be your recommendation then to, for example, leaders of organizations who, who want to continue with you know, Agile delivery, Agile ways of delivery and ways of working? and wish to engage with their vendors because on one hand, there are benefits to working in this manner in the sense that you're working together, you're learning, and then you're adapting your plan based on the new learnings. Uh, But on the other hand, it seems like there is a way to go in bringing up, you know, bringing along uh, you know, legal colleagues and, 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 and colleagues in finance alongside this journey to to have the, the same perspective what would yeah. be your advice um, uh, I, well one of the things is i mean I, I fully accept all the the good things that agile has done and all the good things it, it promises to do but what i'm saying is contracting for that is very difficult and if you end up with a contract that simply um uh, proceeds in talking about you know good way the many lawyers many modern lawyers these days just lapse into this this language of, you know, we'll talk in good faith and reasonably agree this and reasonably agree that. And, uh, and, it, doesn't, and it doesn't really work. You end up with a contract that's just kicked the can down the street numerous times. Um, and so you need to come up with something that is, is, does actually have some teeth. And with Agile, that's going to be difficult. I mean, there are ways of drafting around it, um, but it, it, it's in some ways they're, they're quite cumbersome. So, for example, you can have agreements to uh, agree which are uh, meaningless in um, English law and English law simply doesn't recognize an agreement to agree and you can add as many good faiths and reasonables around it as you like uh, but what you, what you can do is you can then say well one of the drafting techniques you can use is to say well if we don't agree after a period of I don't know one week three months six months whatever it is and then a third party adjudicator will make the decision or an arbitrator or whatever it may be will make the decision effectively for us and we'll provide some criteria for that person to make a decision uh, mm. for us now in in the construction industry they they introduced uh, what they know what's known as an adjudication scheme which mm. is a uh, uh, fix uh, first and fight later effectively so it's simply as if the parties get a dispute rather than just simply falling out with each other and having a huge arbitration leaving the building unfinished you get an adjudicator and it's now compulsory by law for domestic construction contracts. An adjudicator, adjudicator comes in uh, and just makes a quick decision. And it doesn't really matter that it, it, it's not ultimately binding. Mm. For the present purposes, um, it is, I think it's been called temporary finality. Mm. And one of the things that the uh, 
Society for Computers and Law has done is introduce a, a similar adjudication scheme for IT projects. Now that's maybe one way to go, but of course there are two risks immediately with that, uh, which you'd have to advise anybody on. And that is obviously it, it introduces a certain amount of delay and cost because the parties are gonna get into lots of little micro spats um, of trying to get up to uh, coming if they have lots of little adjudications in a major project. And the other problem we've got, of course, is this problem of temporary finality. Once the adjudicator has issued his decision, then you've got to comply with it, even if you think it's wrong, or even if you think it's you know, monstrously unfair mm. or very expensive for you, um, it's, it's, it's temporarily final. And then you'd have to wait till the very end of the project before you could um, then relitigate the matter. So, I mean, there, there are ways of getting around it, but as I say, they're, they're not necessarily um, uh, risk-free or problem-free. Um, and I say one of the, the problems I find, I'm not, you know, for the purposes of my talks with um, uh, on Agile, taking devil's advocate, mm. one of the things you can do is do a word search of any English contract, English law contract, uh, and just count up the number of reasonables, reasonably, and good faiths. Uh, I did one um, Agile contract I looked at, which is available from an online supplier, provider of legal um, services, over 36 pages, it had a staggering total of 29 reasonables, 26 reasonablies and four good faiths. I mean, that is a very high batting average for using these rather horrible terms that in many cases don't really mean anything. Um, so you have been warned. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard, for that. I would take it then that, you know, these are your guidelines for anyone who are considering, I mean, for anyone who is considering um, drafting agile contracts. Be yes, careful absolutely. about how you go about it. It's not risk free, and there's a and there are there are pitfalls to be aware of. And I guess it also all depends on on the jurisdiction, you know, the legal jurisdiction where the contract would be. You're never going to get away from that because as soon as you start using words like a reasonable endeavor, good faith, uh, even if the legal system you're working under actually recognizes them, you then have a dispute trying to work out what on earth it means in practice. And you want a really good example of that? What's a contract under Belgian law that we all know about at the moment and everyone's been talking about it? Have a guess. It's the AstraZeneca contract with the EU Commission. Right. And what is the horrible phrase it uses? best reasonable efforts, hmm. a monstrosity. So not just reasonable efforts, but best, best. Reasonable efforts. Belgian law recognizes that as a concept and English law does as well, but what on earth does it mean? Hmm. What does it mean in practice? What behavior does it mandate? What result does it mandate? Uh, and so the parties then just lumber into a dispute, a dispute, a dispute about the dispute because nobody really knows what they're supposed to be doing anyway. So. Um, you can do it, but you, you, you have been warned. Now, to wrap up, based on our conversation, are there any books that you could, that you would recommend to the listeners if they want to learn more about contracting and agile? What okay. better book, Ula, than uh, Richard Stevens writing about contractual indemnities? I mean, what a right riveting read. Oh, Threat Wow thrilling from beginning to end and it will tell you everything you've ever wanted to know fantastic <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for <laughs> thanks for sharing um we will put the link to your book on the uh, in the show notes alongside with everything else I'm about joking. this it's for episode. lawyers only it's for lawyers only um uh, otherwise <laughs> don't 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 open its covers you will be horrified well actually i mean as, as a as a lawyer as you proved yourself to be maybe you would find it interesting i don't know but now do you have any anything you'd like to ask of the audience or let them know about your practice? Yeah, I mean, as, as I say, I, I do three things which may be of interest to your audience out there. One is um, I'm a commercial solicitor who's very well experienced in um, these areas in terms of putting together contracts for developments, implementations, agile or otherwise. Um, I provide training, not only to lawyers, I do this one day course introducing people to um, the principles of contract law insofar as it would affect professionals working in the IT industry. And I've had people come on that who 
who are project managers all the way up through to board directors of SMEs or even quite large um, companies. I had one uh, major American international company send its commercial management team uh, on that course, for example. Um, and as I say, the other thing I do is I, I work as a mediator. If you're in a dispute and you want someone to try and conciliate uh, a resolution to that dispute, um, then again, I can help you with that. I could even, if he's got an arbitration clause, you want to have uh, an arbitrator appointed, someone who understands a little bit about these things and can come to a, a legal decision on your dispute. I can do that too. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing those. And with respect to, for example, your trainings and um, you know the other services you offer, how can the audience reach you? Um, as usual, these days, they can Google for me. Um, and if you look up for Richard Stevens, there are various academics and I think um, artists who are masquerading as Richard Stevens. If you just <laughs> put Richard Stevens solicitor, you will find me and you will find my website and you can uh, find me or you can search for me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, all sorts of possibilities. So that's 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 very easily done. Okay. Well, I, I have to say from my experience, but maybe I'm not good at Googling, but the last time I tried finding you on LinkedIn, uh, even if I, and, and even if, even though I'd put solicitor against your name, I still had a lot of, uh, um, what's it called, um, results for Richard Stevens solicitor. So what I'm going to do to make it easier for the audience is I'm going to put a, di a direct link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes, if that's okay with yeah, you. Or, 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 or link, yeah, you can do that link into uh, connect to my LinkedIn profile, yeah. or link to my website. It's um, very easy. Uh, no objection to that. Okay, Fine. fantastic. So any final words for the audience before we close this out? It's been a great conversation so far. Yeah, it's been, it's been nice. To, I mean, it, it's funny how this is a problem which I first got involved in 25, 30 years ago. Um, and it, it rumbles along as an issue for IT lawyers. It's never lost its interest, but in 25, 30 years, equally, I haven't seen a, a particularly good resolution to the problem either. And so you've got the industry doing one thing and the lawyers trying to play, um, not so much catch up, but trying to work out still after 25, 30 years of lawyers thinking about it what an agile contract or a contract for an agile project would look like such that it was both legally effective and would satisfy that um, avaricious financial director but it hasn't been resolved yet and the question is will it we don't have to answer well um there there, there is a sort of there are all sorts of resolutions out there um as I mentioned, the adjudication one, um, but that then is the sort of thing you don't want in an agile project because it's, and whilst it's legally effective, um, the idea of agile is you're working cooperatively, cooperatively together and then having little micro adjudications where you're at war with each other, trying to get the best out of the adjudicator in terms of a decision, it then actually tends to drive the parties further away, which is goes against what you did an agile project for in the first place. So, I mean, you can do it, but I, you know, I just don't know how it would work in practice. Well, it's been great speaking with you, Richard. Thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience with the audience and myself. Pleasure. That's all we have for now. Thanks for listening. If you like this show, do subscribe at www.agileinnovationleaders.com That's agileinnovationleaders.com or your favorite podcast provider. Also share with friends and do leave a review on iTunes. This would help others find this show. I'd also love to hear from you so please drop me an email at ola at agileinnovationleaders.com Take care and God bless. Thank you.